And we are so excited to kick off this special event with a special guest researcher from the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Professor Nancy Canwisher is an award-winning researcher and professor of cognitive neuroscience at MIT. And her research involves a special kind of brain imaging that helps identify what parts of the brain are involved in specific functions, like identifying faces or places or processing language. And she studies how those parts of the brain work together to produce intelligence. Please help me welcome Professor Nancy Canwisher to the stage. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks so much for coming. I'm psyched to tell you all about the cool stuff we do in my lab. Uh, and to start, um, I want to say we have made huge progress in my field in just the last 20 years. And to give you a sense of that, let me show you what we knew about the organization of the human brain as recently as 1990. On the left is looking up at the bottom surface of the brain. On the, on the right is a side view of the brain like this. And way back in 1990, we didn't know that much about what the different bits do. We knew that if you had damage to those pink bits, you might have problems with language, producing sentences, understanding sentences. And if you had damage up here from a stroke or other brain injury, you might have trouble paying attention to different parts of space. And if you had damage back in the bottom of the right hemisphere, you might lose your ability to recognize faces, maybe only faces. Right? So that told us that very approximately these locations were involved in these different functions. But that was kind of it. And then, where are we today? Here's where we are today. There are now dozens of regions in the human brain where we have a pretty good idea of what that patch of brain does. And so the regions that I'm showing you here schematically are present in pretty much anybody and approximately the same location in their brain and they do these very specific things. So how do we learn all this? Well, we use a tool called functional MRI, which is just like a regular old MRI machine. You stick a person in there for a scan, but the important thing about functional MRI is that some very smart physicists figured out how to get those pictures to show you not just where the bumps and folds and holes and wrinkles are in the brain, but where the neurons are firing, where there's mental activity. And mental activity, neural activity, is like muscle activity. If you run, you need to send extra blood to supply your muscles. And if you use a whole bunch of neurons right here and they're firing like mad, you need to send extra blood right there. And so functional MRI uses that change in blood flow to tell us what parts of the brain are active. The important advances were that it shows function and that those pictures can be taken very quickly. So you put those two things together and you can make movies of brain activity. So the reason people are excited about this method is it gives us the sharpest pictures you can make of activity in a normal human brain without opening the skull, right? Okay, so that's cool. So how do we use this thing to find those special parts of the human brain? So let me tell you about a super simple experiment. This is one of the first experiments I ever did with functional MRI. We wanted to know, is there a special bit for face recognition? So we pop people in the scanner, and we show them pictures. They're lying on their back, and so you have to project the images over their stomach, and they're looking at the images in a mirror over their forehead. And we show them pictures of faces, like those up there, and pictures of other random objects. And we ask where the blood flow changes are greater when people are looking at faces than when they're looking at objects. Because we want to find the bits that are more involved with face recognition than object recognition. And when you do that, you get pictures like this. So this is a picture of a slice through the brain near the bottom of the brain here. And that little colored bit on the left side is actually on the right side of the brain. But radiologists flip everything just to confuse everyone. That patch, the statistics are telling us that that little patch, the neural activity is higher when that person was looking at faces than when they were looking at objects. To show you the actual data that tell us that, Here's the actual data it's based on. So this is a time course over a five minute scan. And you can see that from that little part of the brain, the signal goes up much more when the subjects are looking at faces, that's where the little Fs are, than when they're looking at objects, that's where the little Os are. So it's that difference that tells us that maybe that region is specialized for face recognition, maybe, okay? 
So first we see that in pretty much everybody we scan. We could pop any of you in the scanner, send me an email, we'll scan you, we'd be happy to. In about 10 minutes we'd find that bit in your brain and it'd be somewhere right in there. So that tells us that it's there in everybody, but it doesn't tell us that it's only involved in face recognition. Right, so what scientists try to do is take their hypothesis, like here's a special bit for face recognition, and their data, like that, and they try to think, is there any way that that hypothesis might not be true, even given this data? Okay, and you guys can all do that. You could come up with other accounts of these data, right? We're social primates, we love faces, we're really interested in them, we look at them all the time. Maybe that region is active whenever you look at anything you're paying attention to. And faces have curvy edges. Maybe it's just interested in curvy bits. Maybe that region only resp responds whenever you look at anything human, not just a face, but a hand or a foot or anything else, right? Maybe it responds when you look at any body part. So all of those are alternative hypotheses. And if we want to really be sure that it's all and only for face recognition, we need to test them. So here's an example of how you do that. Um, you can run a new scan. In this case, we scan people looking at tilted faces versus hands. We scan them again looking at those images, and we find the same little patch. And it responds more to faces than hands. And if you think about it, that we also had a very difficult task subjects were doing. They had to press a button whenever two consecutive images were identical. And that task is really hard with the hands. They all look the same. It's easier with the faces. And so we pushed people to attend even more to the hands. So these data tell us, nope, that region isn't just involved whenever you look at anything human, because it's higher for faces and hands, not just any body part, not just anything you're paying attention to, because they were paying more attention to the hands, and not just anything curvy. Okay, so that's a kind of little example of how we get serious about what exactly does that patch of brain do, okay? I won't tell you about the 100 other experiments we did. I just wanted to give you an example of how you can drill down and really establish what a region does. Okay, so yes, that region is pretty specific for face recognition. That's cool. And so now, this is my brain with a bunch of different functions that we've mapped out in my brain, shown with the icons there. And so the big picture here is that the human brain has all these little parts that do very, very specific things. And that's what we've learned over the last 20 years. So these things are just part of your basic machinery as a human being. We all have these things in about the same place in our brains. And I, like to, I think this is awesome because I think it tells us that these are basically fundamental pieces of your mind that live in those particular parts of your brain. I think this is kind of a sketch of what a human mind is. It has these special purpose parts. But it also raises a million questions. I'm sure you guys already have questions in your head. So I'm gonna tell you about just a few of those. So the first question is this, so far, we have just watched that part of the brain turn on when you look at faces and turn off when you look at other things. That's great, but it doesn't tell us that you need that part of the brain to recognize faces. Maybe it's just going along for the ride. It's not doing the actual work. So in science, we care deeply about the causal role of different things. We want to know not just does that thing turn on when you look at faces. We, need, we want to know is that the part you need that's really doing the work of, of recognizing faces for you. And the only way to test the causal role of a region of the brain is to mess with it, okay? Now normally, we don't get to mess with parts of the human brain. People don't like it when you do that. But there are special circumstances um, when this happens surgically anyway. So a subset of people with epilepsy do not respond well to drugs. And if you do not respond well to drugs and you have such severe epilepsy that you're having many seizures a day, you can't live a normal life. That's not a good situation to be in. So those people sometimes go in for neurosurgery. And this is quite hardcore. Um, what the neurosurgeons do is they remove a bone flap and they put electrodes right on the surface of the brain. And they do that to find the source of the epilepsy so that they can remove it. They also do it to map out functions. And so very rarely, people who are getting this um, clinical treatment for epilepsy anyway are hanging out in the hospital with electrodes sitting right on their brain. 
And if they're really nice, then they will look at our pictures and we can record from their brains. And the neurosurgeons who are stimulating parts of their brain electrically will make a videotape and show us what they find. This is important because it's a causal test. We are messing with the system, or that is, the neurosurgeons are messing with the system, and we scientists are just saying, oh, I would love to learn from this, okay? So let me introduce you to this guy here. He's a Japanese barber who had severe epilepsy, and about a couple years ago, he showed up for neurosurgery at a hospital in Japan. Now, interestingly, the neurosurgeons had decided to put electrodes all over the bottom of his brain there to map out the source of his epilepsy. And just for comparison, here's the bottom of my brain. And you can see in my brain, the little red patches right there are the face-specific bits. And you can see they have electrodes right on top of what looked like they would be the face-specific bits in this Japanese gentleman. And so now the question is, what happens when the neurosurgeons electrically stimulated that part of this guy's brain? So they're stimulating right there. Remember, this guy has no idea there's a face region in the brain. He has no idea what part of his brain is being stimulated. So he's looking at the face and he's getting stimulated right on top of that face selective region. So he's looking at the face and he's getting stimulated right on top of that face selective region. Okay, so when he's looking at a face and that region is stimulated, it distorts the face. But now he's just looking at a box, stimulated in the same region. What's going to happen? No change. So when you stimulate that region, when he's looking at a box, he sees a face on top of the box. Okay? This is a kanji character on a card that he's looking at. How crazy is that? He's looking at a Japanese character, and that little face part of his brain is being electrically stimulated by the neurosurgeons, and he sees a face on top of the character. So that's causal data. That tells us if you mess with that part of the system, you produce a change in experience. That tells us that region is really involved in face perception. Now you might think, well, we're interested in faces. As I said, we're social primates. We look at them all the time. Maybe any place you stimulate in the brain, people see faces. So let's see what happens when they stimulate right next door. Right next door, now if you, it's hard to see, but in my brain, there's a little teeny purple bit. That purple bit is a part that responds to color in my brain. And he's got electrodes right in that location. So let's ask, what does he experience if he's stimulated right on those electrodes that respond to color? Let's find out. Again, he has no idea there's a color part of the brain. この箱の真ん中見てたら、あの、この半分が、この虹、虹色になんか光、光ったりしてますね。この真ん中見てたら、ボール見てたらもうやっぱ先が幅、明らかに幅広い感じ。なんかちょっと虹色に点滅してるん
鼻あたりに目線を見てたらやっぱこちらの半顔半分が。Okay, you get the idea. So you stimulate one little region that likes faces, and if you stimulate there, people see faces, even if there isn't a face there. Right next door, in a region that responds strongly to color, you stimulate there, and he sees a rainbow. Amazing. So this is powerful causal evidence that those regions not only respond when you see faces or color, but they are doing the actual work that produce your percept of a face and a color. Okay. It tells us that the face region is very specifically causally involved in face perception, and the color region is very specifically involved in perceiving colors. Okay, there's loads of other questions about this picture of the brain. Like, how do you wire it up in development? How is it so similar in every person? How does the brain know to put the face region right there and the color region right next to it? Okay, your first thought. Looking at that, or many people would think, well, it must be innate. If it's the same in everybody, it must be innate, right? But that's not true for everything. Not every little region in there is innate. And I'll tell you about one little region shown in purple up there called the visual word form area. And that's a little patch of the brain that responds strongly when you look at words or letter strings. Okay? So here's a response from some of our data in a bunch of eight year olds who we scanned. And that purple bar shows you a really strong response of that region, right in that region when the participants were looking at words and letter strings, and a much lower response when they were looking at objects and other things. Now, these subjects happened to be kids who had been in the lab three years before, and they'd been scanned on a similar experiment. So we looked at the region that responded to words, and we aligned it with their data from when they were five years old, and we said, what was that region doing when they were five before they learned to read? Answer, it was not selectively responsive to words. So that tells you that it's a process of learning to read in between age five and age eight that wires up that region. Experience is necessary. Now, that doesn't mean that experience is necessary to wire up all the other regions, but it means it's, it's what's going on here. Really, what we want to know is not just what's happening later in life, but what's happening early in infants. How fast is this stuff wired up? So, my friend Rebecca Sachs did an amazing study over the last bunch of years. She wanted to ask whether some of those face and other selective regions are present even in infants, right? And so, what she did was she set out to scan infants who were four to six months old. And as you can imagine, that is barely possible. The infants are fussing, their parents are nervous, it's perfectly safe, but it's a tricky thing to do, okay? It took Rebecca many years of work. There were many Technical advances that were necessary. She made this specialized device out of an infant recliner with a measurement device in the scanner. So they're in this infant recliner in the scanner. And she found that that face region and another region were present already in six month old infants. So that tells you they develop really early, but it also doesn't tell us exactly how they get wired up in development. We know that at least one region, that visual word form area, is wired up by experience, but we don't know the role of experience in wiring up all of those other regions. Okay? And so that's weird, that's kind of cutting edge of the field right now. Lots of labs are working on that problem. My lab is working on that problem. We're doing it in part by scanning congenitally blind people when they touch things, asking if you get a face area when you touch faces. I think you do. I'm not yet sure. We're in the middle of it. If you know any congenitally blind people who want to help us out with our research, send them my email. I'd love to hear from them. And of course, the third major question is I've been talking so far only about specialized parts of the human brain、um, that are involved in different kinds of perception faces, reading words, seeing colors, right? But so, do we have special parts for really high level abstract aspects of thinking? Right? Things that maybe only humans do. And in、uh, work over the last few years, we've shown absolutely you do. It's not just that we have special little bits for perceiving things, we have special bits for thinking as well. And in particular, we've shown that those language regions that I showed you, the big pink blob at the beginning of the talk, those language regions, you can find them with functional MRI, and you can scan people and you can ask do those regions turn on when people do other things? That aren't language. 
like listening to music, like doing arithmetic, like holding information in working memory? And the answer is no, no, no. The language regions are super specific for language. And so you may have wondered, what is the relationship between language and thought? People have been wondering about that question for probably millennia. And I think we've started to answer it because we can show that the parts of your brain that are engaged when you understand the meaning of a sentence are completely different than the parts of your brain that are engaged when you do arithmetic or, um, or listen to music or do all this other kind of stuff. Another special part of the brain that we're studying right now uh, is music. It turns out there are special populations of neurons in your brain that respond very specifically to music. And what's weird and cool about them is that they respond to all different kinds of music. It doesn't matter if it's a heavy metal band or a classical flute solo or a rap artist. Yes, rap activates those very same uh, music neurons. And now we're trying to figure out what aspect of music is making them fire and are they innate or do they develop with experience? And the final, perhaps most amazing bit of brain was also discovered by my friend Rebecca Sachs. She found a part of the brain that's active only when you think about what other people are thinking. And if that seems crazy, realize that this is just kind of the essence of what it is to be a human being, right? We do this all the time. I'm doing it right now when I look out at you guys and it's like, do they get how awesome that is? These guys get how awesome it is. I can see it on your faces, right? Um, we do that in every conversation. It's why a novel is engaging, is it's all about what people are thinking. So it's really these music and language and thinking about other people's thoughts, these are quintessentially human abilities. And what we've been discovering is they are implemented in very specific parts of your brain that do just that. And I'm over time already, so I will stop talking and take questions. Thank you.